people show up for you live, whether it's virtually or in person, because they feel this sense of connection, this deep attraction to who you are and what you teach, they're making such a huge commitment when they're there going to show up live for mm-hmm. something. Like you have to clear your calendar. You have to yeah. You have to book travel if you're going in person. Like there's so many things right. that you have to do in order to show up live for someone. And so you make a good point that we really need to keep our lists warm. If I mean, I know it's like common sense isn't always common practice. You really have to keep your list warm if you're going to want to have like high engagement in your event promotion. How are entrepreneurs like us daring bravely to build a stage, ditch the sweatpants, and step up to the mic? How do we create our own transformative events so we can get our message out into the world in a bigger way that's not only profitable, but it's actually something we can be proud of? That's the question. And the answers are inside this podcast. My name is Sarah Pfeiffer. Welcome to Green Room Central. Today, I brought into Green Room Central Studios Nancy Geary, a course creation expert. She works with businesses of all sizes, from solopreneurs to Fortune 100 companies, to turn their expertise into a high profit course. She creates engaging, fun, and interactive programs that get results. She regularly runs live five-day challenges, masterclasses, and workshops about all things course creation. She feels it's important for authors, speakers, and coaches to learn how to design engaging, fun, and interactive programs that their customers will want to buy and actually finish. Hey there, Nancy. Welcome to Green Room Central Studios. Say hello to Lynchpin Nation. Hey, Lynchpin Nation. I'm glad to be here. I appreciate you sharing your time with us today. And I want to start by asking you, what is your superpower as it relates to events in your business? My superpower is that I balance creativity with analysis to ensure everything is really well designed. Talk to me about the the creativity side. Well, the creativity is to really look at what's the what's the delivery platform that you're on. And so what are the opportunities and what are the constraints? And so how can you make the most out of, out of the experience by really leveraging what's available to you? You know, it's different when you're in a virtual setting as opposed when you're in a room. So one real simple trick that I added in to events that I've been doing last year is I come up with a countdown timer at the beginning, but I'm on camera inside this little window and then the clock is running and I look at who's in the who's already logged in and I start engaging them in conversation as if I was at a live event I, you know you walk around you go from table to table hey yes. how are you what do you want to learn today blah, blah 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 and I found by just adding that at the beginning I start to get engagement right away and now that people know that I'm doing that they'll come on 10 minutes early to talk <laughs> so oh I, I mean, love it's, that. it was very simple but very effective yeah, uh, Lynchpin Nation, I believe there's a, an episode about chat moderation. Uh, I'll, I'll link it up in the show notes. But I do think there's such huge amounts of value in being in the chat, whether it's you or assigning somebody from your team because when it's a virtual event, because we really want people to feel seen and heard yes. and celebrated. And that is a really big key way of doing so within a virtual event environment. It really helps to have a digital producer, someone that can be managing the chat. So if you're the presenter, Mm -hmm. you can kind of keep rolling, talking about what you need to talk about, and then kind of agree ahead of time when that person should um, chime in with questions, whether you're going to do it at a particular interval or something maybe like, just like, hey, you got to take care of this now, but to kind of agree ahead of time. It just makes such a huge difference because sometimes the chat can move so fast, you can't keep up with it, right? I mean, it's like, whoa, right. what's happening? Wait, stop, <laughs> I can't, and you miss the moment. Yeah, and it'll, like you said, miss the moment and you'll lose your train mm-hmm. of thought so easily. If you always keep, once you're rolling, if you always bouncing to the chat, you can just lose your train of thought. And I, I have heard some, 
some presenters tell people, okay, right now, I just want you present with me. Let's be quiet and let's quiet the chat so that everyone can stay present in here and now. Uh, but but there are there's just so many other times when you want them engaging yeah. uh, and you've asked them to engage, but you need to keep the the ship uh, on on track here and moving forward. And yeah, it is nice to have that producer, the chat moderator in the chat. <laughs> so creativity, uh, give me an example. So you said your superpower was balancing creativity and analytics, right? right? Tell me that. Let's talk about the analytics part. Well, the analytics bit. part is that's deciding what it is that you need to cover to meet the needs of your audience. So you want to look at it from the perspective of well, what do I want them to get out of this? By the end of this program, what are they going to be able to mm -hmm. do? What are they going to know? Mm -hmm. And how do I want mm -hmm. them to feel? And it's kind of working through. So that's really working through the, the, what, what you're going to cover and how you're going to handle it. Then the creativity comes into, well, given if this is my content, how am I going to teach it in a way so that it will be interactive, engaging, compelling, and keep everybody kind of, uh, you know, on board? Uh, oftentimes, online courses, <laughs> you know, there's a the completion rates aren't that great. Their statistics are all over the place in terms of of what they are. I mean, people get in, they get started, and if something hasn't been well thought out in terms of this is the content, this is the right sequence to teach it in. That's the first level. Then the second level is where are you doing it in a way that's holding my interest? So a lot of our listeners are course mm -hmm. creators. And uh, you mentioned the statistics about completion of online courses. And I've heard that it's something like 85% of people do yeah, not finish. That's about what I've heard. You know, I've heard yeah. anywhere from 85 to 90. <laughs> Wow. And it's it's so odd for me to hear that because I'm a finisher. And so I don't understand how, like, I don't understand that group of people that I aren't think, yeah. finishers because <laughs> <laughs> that's not me. But um, what I, what I want to, where I want to go with this it, question is, so where do you see events playing a role with course creation businesses because you know we can't offer them our more high-end offers if well we can but like the the chance of them converting into the higher ticket offers that we have after the course are lower if they haven't gone through the course and created that like that and the course would create that no like trust like really deepen the relationship mm -hmm. Uh, with our clients and make them even more primed and ready for that high ticket offer that's next in our Ascension model. So talk to me about where you see events playing when we ha we don't have those high completion rates. We want to look at the event as not just a, is not a one-off, but it's, it's a, it's a moment in time. Mm. So mm -hmm. what would be the types of activities that you would do before the event to engage people. So perhaps you've got, you have a whole email thread to bring them in. There's the whole funnel to get them there. But is there some kind of a pre, let's say, show video that they could watch to get them excited? Uh, is there one of your online courses that people could participate in as a pre-event? So I'm curious, when you're getting started and warming up and growing your list to get ready to go into an event. What do you do? What I did initially when I kind of made a shift in where I was going is I did a series of what I would call warm up types of emails where I was giving people good tips. Just a short tip like what's what's a good hack for doing moving from um, a webinar to an online course? How can you be efficient to do that? And I had like 10 steps that they could follow to do that. And I had, you know, that's just one example. Because when I first started getting things going, I hadn't touched my list in a while. So some people could have figured, man, I thought she was dead. So <laughs> I wanted to give yeah. them some, excuse me, some good information first and then come in and say, now I would like to invite you. That's something I see people make a mistake on frequently is that they go and only talk to their list when they're going to run their annual conference or 
that big event and people are just not warm enough or yeah. ready enough people show up for you live whether it's virtually or in person because they feel this sense of connection this deep attraction to who you are and what you teach they're making such a huge commitment when they're there going to show up live for mm-hmm. something like you have to clear your calendar you have to yeah you have to book travel if you're going in person. Like there's so many things right. that you have to do in order to show up live for someone. And so you make a good point that we really need to keep our lists warm. If, I mean, I know it's like common sense isn't always common practice. You really have to keep your list warm if you're going to want to have like high engagement in your event promotion. So then moving on into the event and you talk about how you set goals for your event by the end of the event. What do you want your audience to be able to do? And I teach that inside of live event Academy. That's so important. And I want to hear your take on, on that. And, and I think we we're looking at that at, at two, on two levels. The first, what do I want them to be able to do? That's the, that's the knowledge or skill that they're going to acquire as a result of spending their precious time with me. The other level Mm -hmm. is uh, in terms of my call to action and how would I like them to continue to engage with me? And so that's where the the offer comes into play. But the Mm. the more, and that's just part of everything that, that we're doing. It's more important though, to be really clear on what's the outcome going to be for them because that should drive how you build out your course, your event, whatever the, whatever the learning experience is in whatever yeah. form or fashion, that is the fundamental question that needs to drive everything. You know, I, and an, and a, an event is a learning experience. It's not unlike a course. Right. Uh, so tell me, give us some t- tangible examples of how you tell people what they're getting out of this. Well, so if I'm working on something um, with a client, for example, that so uh, somebody that's working in the um, diversity and inclusion space, so an mm-hmm. outcome there would be for people to get clear about um, what is the what is the role that they're playing. How are they con- how are they contributing? Are they an ally or are they an accomplice? Is what one of the people that I've been mm. working with has put into place. You know, for me, what is something that I run, I want them to be able to create a design blueprint so that they will be able to execute the completion of a course, that they'll have all the variables figured out in terms of what they need to put into place. So it's it's that end goal, it's that objective, it's the it's the transformation statement. Uh, take action on improving your your diet. You'll have tools that you'll learn that you can use to to eat better. I mean, I'm just kind of coming up with all these, but it's it's kind of like whatever yeah. your content domain is. What is the what is it that someone's going to be able to do after that experience that they weren't doing before? And do you think it's important to boil it down into a one sentence statement like that? I like having a one sentence kind of a transformational statement of what's the, yeah. what's the overall experience. And then kind of, you know, working backward, what's, what's interesting when people go to, whether you're writing a course or you're writing a book or you're writing a speech, people will often want, well, I'm going to start with the introduction and work my way through when in fact you want to begin with the end in mind and you want to work backwards and say, if this is the place that I want to get them to, what's the journey that I need to take them on? And the introduction should be the very last thing that you write because it needs to position kind of where you're taking people to. And just, I think just making a shift to focusing on outcomes and results, it's, it's freeing, you know, this is where like where this sort of balancing analysis and creativity comes into play. If I'm really clear about where I'm going, there's, there's a certain constraint that I'm operating inside of, which gives me the freedom to be creative because I know the space that I'm playing in. I'm not going, the creativity is going to be focused. It's not going to be like all this crazy stuff coming in from all over the place that may or may not be of any value. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I, 
when I train, I talk about how the very beginning of the process of hosting your own event needs to start with why. Why are you yeah. hosting the event for your business and why are you hosting the event for your community? And it feels like that one sentence transformation statement focusing on those outcomes and results really is the, the, one of the answers to that. Mm-hmm. Why are you doing this for your community? Yes, definitely. I love that. Yeah, it, it all starts with why. Why? <laughs> it's a lot of work, so you want to be clear <laughs> of where you're going. It is. I, I talk about how yeah, it is a lot of work and you want to know where you're going, but knowing those two whys at the beginning before getting all excited and off to the races on finding a venue or a guest speaker or the swag that you're going to give out is really getting grounded yeah. in those two whys because those two whys will then become a lighthouse and guide all the decisions that you make from here throughout you know, the entire event process. And you touched on that, that... Uh, it, it gives us a box mm-hmm. within which to be creative. Yeah, absolutely. Because otherwise, you know, what if you, you, you see some great swag, but it really, then yet you get, you get, you start building stuff out and you go, oh, I bought that swag, but it really wasn't the right, the right swag. Or I yeah, spent all this time on exactly. doing this activity and it's really not the right activity. So having that, mm-hmm. you know, and what I like to tell people is this doesn't mean that all these, you have to like completely shut down all of these ideas write them down, but save them for another day. It's like, you know, whenever the shiny object shows up, I look at it and go, do you fit with what I'm doing? Yes or no. Do you get to stay or do you have to go? (laughs) Right. You know, and it's, it's like, it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it, it's just a question. It's not a question of if I'm going to do it. It's a question of when am I going to do it? Where is it going to fit? Um, anybody Mm. out there in linchpin land, that's a writer, how often have you mm-hmm. had to have to throw away a really great line because it just isn't going to work? And it's hard, mm. but you go, but it, people are going to be, what the heck is this? Where did that come from? So. So good. So good. Yeah, I, I do. <laughs> I do. Uh, I do preach about having a parking lot that's just labeled not this event. Yeah, not today. <laughs> uh, yeah, because it's just sometimes it's just not the right fit and it doesn't like I don't want you to feel like you're throwing out your baby uh it it can have a fit it's just not going to be at this event so let's move on and talk about uh let's talk about guest speakers Mm -hmm. and how they can complement or enhance your program and before I have you answer that my position, just so you're aware, <laughs> is that I think sometimes people hide behind guest speakers, that they discount the value that they have inside of them. They discount the that they could stand on a stage alone and hold space for a whole day, for a full three-day event. And instead, they go and gather up a whole bunch of guest speakers to hide behind and and I'm guessing that you might feel a little bit the same because you're such a huge advocate <laughs> for online courses I do and <laughs> people getting their knowledge out there so talk to me about how you think about guest speakers guest speakers like you said they can enhance or they can they can detract depending on what's happening mm-hmm and I do agree that sometimes people are going to hide behind a guest speaker. And much of it, it deals with the amount of depth that you want to get into. So, for example, mm-hmm. my expertise is in instructional design and course creation. And I have learned a bit about marketing along the way. So I could talk about marketing. I could talk about an Ascension model. I could, there are certain things I can talk about at a high level. But if there's sort of nitty-gritty tactics... I would want to bring in an expert on that topic. So I think it's to look at from the the perspective of how does this person complement me and what I'm Mm -hmm. offering? I had somebody um, come on uh, an event and I thought, uh, you know, it kind of sounds like we do the same thing. So then you're you're hurting yourself if you have somebody that's going to be... um, representing their program <laughs> and then sort right. of giving people a, an option um, to, to work with either one. So it's yeah. really, it's just really important to vet them carefully 
And how are they going to enhance the program? How are they going to complement what you do? Are they going to be a strategic partner? Are they going to be someone that you can have an alliance with? And are they, go are they going to deliver information at a level of depth that you don't have? You know, like in the example that I gave, you know, there's certain things that I can talk about and how to use Zoom effectively, but I'm, but there's, you know, probably more things in Zoom that I don't know that are maybe, you know, more, um, you have to have, there's just more, there's things I don't know. And then I have yes. to look at my audience and go, well, how much does my audience really need to know about Zoom? for an example. Right. And can, do I have the, the depth of experience to share it? Prop, you know, to a certain extent, yes. Or do I really need to have someone else come in that's going to go to larger depth? Because one of the other places that comes up a lot is sort of the, the, techno uh, the technology side of what online platform should I use? What do the different platforms do? How do they all work? I can talk to, I can speak to that at a certain level. But if someone wants real specific information about their situation, then I'd want to have them talk to somebody who knows, like my online business manager, I would bring her in to, uh, to handle, the, to get people to a level of depth that I just can't get to. So it makes me right. sound shallow, but there's somebody yeah. wants to know how to structure their course. I can talk about that all day. All day long. Well, I don't think it's <laughs> shallow. I think it's smart because I think we all have expertise and a passion in a certain space and a definite, a huge amount of depth in that space. And there are a lot of adjacent uh, spaces that would complement, I love that word, the uh, work that you do and would add value to your community. And it makes mm -hmm. sense to have them at an event, like if I was going to bring Lynchpin Nation together and I, you know, going to teach on how to picture plan and produce an event. And, uh, I know that one of the biggest challenges for every event host is filling it. <laughs> and right now, perhaps like there's some strategies that are working on like TikTok or something or an Instagram that are just crushing it when it comes to filling events, well, it would make sense for me to bring in a TikTok yes. expert and it would make sense for me to bring in an Instagram expert if we were going to have an in-depth day on filling events I of what's working now. that It doesn't make me a shallow <laughs> person, you know, because I'm not like the world's greatest expert on TikTok and Instagram. I mean, yeah, I'm, TikTok I know is enough just, to be dangerous. I, that's it. If you, <laughs> but, if you kind of look at something and say, I know enough to be dangerous then it's probably a good, that's a red flag that you probably want to bring in somebody to help you. But I think it, it's just, it's, um, get, really, you got to make the decision. Is this just something that I'm afraid? I know it, but I'm afraid. Or do I really need somebody who mm. it can be my strategic partner and will will carry that, that forward? Mm, so good. So good. Let's move on and talk about the experience that you create. And I, you've used the, the, the phrase a few times, uh, about just the, the journey of your guest through the event. And I want to dig in on that topic and understand how you think about creating that, that experiential journey for those who come to your events. I think it, it starts with how you welcome people. So I gave the example of, of coming on with the, with the timer and yep. then looking at, okay, from end to end, what am I going to do? And how, so how am I going to approach it? And one thing that I have found inter interesting inspiration from, because around the topic of engagement, because it's about creating engagement. And engagement just means that you're going to be changing it up as you go through. There's going to be, there's going to be a movement. Let's say it opens up, you start out, countdown timer, then you're on camera. And then perhaps you're going to be doing, you're going to have some slides that are going to come up and then you're going to have an activity. And what's interesting about uh, all of this to me is I've come to this conclusion just in the last couple of days, talking with a good, a good, um, one of my strategic partners now that we want to think about what we're doing as a show. When the pandemic hit, 
it was about how do I present online? So people were taking their content and going, okay, now how do I, how do I do what I used to do in a big room on the small screen? Or maybe a big screen, depending on what type of monitor right? somebody is looking <laughs> at, right? But when we're working within a screen, we have to think about that it's a smaller space. You know, some people will say you need to stand back and you need to be a certain distance away from the camera. Well, is that really how it needs to be? Or do you need to be thinking about how you're going to be positioned? Do you need to think about, do I want to bring in any graphics? Uh, do I want to invest in, I'm so I'm a Mac user, so I've invested in Ecamm and I use a Stream Deck, which allows me to very deftly, very quickly switch from scene to scene to scene. So often, I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, hang on. And then you got to go through all the things and how are you going to share it? And then, can you all see my screen now? <laughs> okay, that's a little bit annoying. By just thinking about, well, how can I leverage some tools? I can make that experience better because I can do a transition. What I discovered in doing that is because I just push a button to go from me on camera to a screen, I can increase engagement by having the screen show with my presentation, talk about this, talk about what's there, then go back on camera and look at the camera and engage with the audience and have a bit more, make it more conversational and then go back into the presentation. So being able to move like that very quickly makes it more effective, makes it more personal and perhaps even more intimate. And I encourage people to start really looking at how is a news show run? As annoying as it can be, but mm -hmm. how are they structured? How mm -hmm. are they organized? What's going on? How often do scenes change when you're watching a TV show or a movie? It's about yeah. four or five seconds. So you want to think about when, you, when you're shifting from one idea to another, you want to have a change happen. A great example of this, because I always look for inspiration from other places, is I was on a, on a plane and it was time for the safety briefing. Now, when it's the, the flight attendant doing the briefing in the aisle, I only really pay attention if they're, if they're like right, <laughs> right next to me, right in front of me, because it would be rude not to look at them when they're right, right there. I'll make a, okay, great, yeah, I'll watch you. Now, on, um, it was United had it as a video on a flight that I was just on with them. And every time there was a key point or sub point, the scene changed which held my attention. What they did that was brilliant is the scene changes were going to fabulous parts of the world that the only way that I could get there would be on a plane. <laughs> so, so it got me on two levels. I was like, oh, I would love to go to Bali. Oh, I'd love to go and mm -hmm. celebrate a special holiday. You pick your country. While I'm looking at how to put on a seatbelt, the oxygen, you know, all of those yes. key points it held my attention. And I thought, you know, that is something that anybody that's in the course creation business really needs to think about. How can I, what can I do to make a change that's going to hold people's attention? And the Couldn't scene changes more. is one way that you can do it really quite easily. If you are willing, you know, to maybe make the investment in the technology so you can do things fairly um, quickly. And, and even if you're just moving through a slide deck, if it's one beautiful image after another, that holds people's attention. I'm always flattered when somebody tells me how much they love my slides. I put a lot of time and attention into keeping them beautiful and simple and use mm -hmm. lists very sparingly. <laughs> or oh, so or calling on people in the chat, calling people out by name, not, in a, not calling them out, but addressing somebody and saying, Hey, what do you think? And, you know, and I usually do that with people that I, that I know already, you know, they're kind of in, in my world instead of somebody that I've never <laughs> heard from it or it's like, because I don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable. But when you are saying, so Sarah, what do you think about that? People are going to have to, are going to start to pay attention because, Oh my God, she might call on me. <laughs> so it's just, it's, it's not complicated. It's just looking at how can I make a shift and when can you, how often can you have them be doing something and not just watching? So when is there an opportunity 
to put people into a breakout room for a discussion, to ask people to put up a reaction, to pause and have them do a personal reflection type of an exercise. It's all about how do you bring all of these elements into play and that's what makes engagement. Yeah, so good. And Lynchpin Nation, what I want you to underline there is what she said back at the beginning of this answer was changing it up. That's like the name of the game here for creating engagement. And she gave you so many great ideas for how to do that. If it isn't the technology, it's which I, I do strongly <laughs> recommend in uh, investing in that so we can all run our own really engaging virtual events from home. But uh, you don't have to. You can be using all those ideas she gave you, which are playing playing videos, uh, playing music, using the breakouts, mm-hmm. the slide changes, the, the beautifully uh, designed slide decks for sure, uh, journaling, chatting in the, um, in the virtual event space. It, those are all ways to change it up and definitely be remembering uh, – what Nancy said about when we watch, and this is especially true for virtual events, when we're watching TV or a movie, remembering, noticing next time you're watching one of those mediums, how often they change the scene. And it's so intentional and it's happens way more often than we think or notice. Exactly. It does. But <laughs> it's, uh, it keeps us engaged and, and, in the virtual space, we are creating <laughs> our own TV show, if you will. And in in person, it's it's not that different. I mean, you've been sitting in an audience before and gotten wiggly in your seat and be noticing uh, when that happens and why that happened for you and how you can do things a little bit differently inside of your event. Maybe it was time to take a stand up and take a stretch break or, you know, high five the person sitting next to you or journal for a moment and, or close your eyes and do a meditation or watch a movie, you know, like have them show a video. Like it's it just people need things changed, changed up. We, we get distracted <laughs> we <do>. easily and <laughs> bored easily. That's for sure. So when you're at an event, how do you stay present and really let uh, your brilliance, if you will, shine through? As a, as a presenter? As a presenter, yeah. You know, I think a lot of it is, you know, to get yourself to the point that you know your content well enough that it's not memorized, but it it's very organic. So it's very, I, I like to think like I'm having a conversation with my audience and that if they see me when I'm off stage or off camera, they're gonna experience the same person. Now, if I'm on a big stage, my personality mm. is going to be a little bit bigger. But generally, if it, it's being conversational, it's smiling, it's being being um, approachable but authoritative. Yeah. Yeah, I that authoritative. I uh, underline that one because it's your job to control the room. Yes, and when you don't. Uh, you lose the respect of those who are your guests. Mm-hmm. It's it's an important job uh, when you're when you're presenting. So, can you give us a few examples of things that you say, phrases that you say during a presentation that keep it conversational? Maybe they're rhetorical questions or. Just ways that you're eliciting feedback from the audience as you go through. One thing is I can't help myself in the moment. I do, I do ad lib and I do make uh, jokes or comments about what I see. I can't, I just, I can't in the moment, I can't help myself. If, if something's happening, I'll, um, I'll address it. And I always come in, you know, with, with a plan 
and how I'm going to manage this, this session. But mm -hmm. things happen in the moment that you need to be able to respond to. You need to be able to bring it into the conversation. So I did a virtual event where I had some problems with some tools that I wanted to demonstrate. Technology was not okay. my friend that day. Sure. We've right. Had, so we've, we've had, all been so, there. But what I was able to do was turn it into the teachable moment and say, if this happens to you, what you, how, what's going to be your plan? How are you going to definitely be able to move it? How, you know, and I just said, you know, if you notice, I, you know, you probably see in my face that I was a little bit like, oh, but I got my composure quickly and I was able to turn it around and talk about, okay, how do you, when, when things go wrong, what else can you talk about? If you're, you know, if your slides, I did something one time and I run my, uh, keynote presentation through my iPad. Well, I have two power sources. One is the one that plugs into the computer, so it'll actually work. And the other one is that it plugs into the wall. And I didn't have it plugged in properly. The presentation didn't work. I had to talk for 15, 20 minutes. And I just, I just shifted in the moment to what I was going to do. I didn't make a big deal about it. I just said, you know, well, slides aren't working today. So, but, but you know, but here we go. And I think to right. just kind of, when people see an expert having a moment of vulnerability, what it does is it makes them feel like, hey, I can probably do this too. You know, mm. it, they like mm -hmm. it. I think they like it when you're not perfect. Because it, 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 opens, it opens it up for them to try to do something that maybe they wouldn't have done before. And certainly, you know, yeah. asking questions of people, leaning into the comments. If, if there's people in the audience, if I know uh, what they're up to, you know, with courses that I've helped them create or that I know that they've already built... I'll reference what I'm seeing, you know, what I'm, what I've observed in, in other, um, around other people. And it's just, I think it's being in the moment, having a plan, but being in the moment. Yeah. And because the deal is <laughs> if any of us doesn't deliver every bit of information that we planned, no one's going to know. <laughs> you're right so it's like oh i no forgot that know. it was such a great story well okay another day <laughs> right right oh so true they're they're not gonna know what was planned mm -hmm. only you do only i do the only, i'm the only one that knows how much i forgot that day <laughs> so uh i want to touch on follow-up uh before we sure. wrap up i want to touch on how you follow up after an event I'm guessing, and because you are a course creation expert, I'd love to hear your take on where courses fit in in the follow-up. Okay. Well, the first part in the, in the follow-up is how am I going to stay connected with my audience? So there's always an email sequence that goes out after the events that I do for myself about, hey, you know, you can sign up, you can still sign up, or wasn't that great? Kind of a a whole thread to move them to the next stage in the funnel. Is that a thread that reminds them of the offer mm -hmm. that you made at the yes. event? So it's okay. really kind of following through on the call to action and creating a little bit of urgency that, you know, the, whatever deal I'm offering that the, the door and the deal is going to close at a certain point in time. So there's, yes. there's that part of it. The other part in the follow-up can, can be around providing them with some, um, maybe bonus content is what's coming to mind, but here's, here's a, uh, an art, uh, um, here's a, a course that you might find useful, giving them something else that they can do. Cause I think you want to look at maybe putting them into that as a reminder. Hey, here's a recording that I did about, um, uh, how to move from a webinar to an evergreen course. Here's a short recording mm -hmm. about that. So to kind of just give people some other little snippets of information so that they don't, yep. they feel like they're still getting something from you, value. some value from you. So it's really looking yep. at, again, there's like the whole continuum of what type of content am I going to deliver before the event to, that will position people for the event? 
what will happen after the event for those that are going to continue on. So there's there's a little bit of work before you're going to join the group, before you're going to start the one-on-one. Yes. There's that. There's, you know, there's that. So it's what are all the different possible um, roads that people are going to go down depending on, you know, the, the choice that they made. Um, you know, do they, uh, there's always the option to have a discovery call, which does tie a bit into uh, doing ongoing work with people. So if we plan to mm-hmm. um, work to, you know, if you're not quite sure what you want to do, well, let's just jump on a call and see what happens next. Yeah. So do you use any sort of, if you're keeping your cart open after the event, do you use some sort of bonus that expires at the event to create urgency to buy there? Yeah, I'll have like the first three people, the first five people will get get this, and that that's only good for 24 hours or something like that. Sure. To get the click to buy. That's so good. <laughs> yes, yes. As we wrap up here, Nancy, I want to go into a bit of a... Um, very rapid fire segment. Okay. And I'm going to ask you a few questions and I just want you to tell me the first thing that comes to mind. All right, here we go. Are you ready? (laughs) What do you say to yourself backstage and on stage? It's showtime. I love that. What's your best tip for filling your events? Keep your list warm. Mm Mm-hmm. What's your favorite moment at events that you host? Uh, when I do hot seat coaching. Oh, love that. What's the best thing about hosting your own events? You have control. Mm. Mm-hmm. What are you reading right now? Atomic Habits. So good. <laughs> I need to read that one again. What have you got going on right now that we should know about? And where can Lynchpin Nation find you? Well, I'm getting ready uh, with uh, Tr- Rich, who goes by nickname Trigger, Bond Trigger. We're putting together a four-week program. It'll be two weeks about design and two weeks about media savvy. So thinking of your um, your courses like a show. And then after that, There's going to be, I'm going to be, we together are launching a membership group that's going to start in September. And the best way, uh, because this is all, we're baking it now, the cake is not quite in the oven, (laughs) uh, would be for people to just email me, which is uh, nancy at nancygeary.com. And Geary is G-I-E-R-E. And if you're interested, or you can call or text me at 414 315-9809. 315-9809. 414. That that uh, that area code hails from where I grew oh. up in Wisconsin. <laughs> I lived there most of my adult life. And I went to college oh. there. We're headed there on a road trip nice. next week. I'm excited. Nancy, thank you so much for being here. Oh, my here. pleasure. I really appreciate it. I'm going to link up uh, your email and your phone number and your website and all the goodies uh, in the show notes so people can find you and just grateful for you sharing your wisdom about online courses and engagement inside of events today. It's just been, it's been a fun conversation. Oh, I've enjoyed it so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Green Room Central podcast. If you loved this episode with Nancy, then please take a screenshot on your phone and post it to Instagram and be sure to tag at Sarah Pfeiffer and let me know why you liked it and what you'd like to hear or who you'd like to hear from in the future. That'll help me know what to create for you. Also, if scaling events in your business sounds like something you want to tackle in 2022 and you need a coach, let's connect to see if one-on-one coaching is for you. Just go to greenroomcentral.com. You and I can work together one-on-one throughout the course of the year and dive deep into the inner workings of your events and business. You'll receive mentorship, personalized feedback, and customized guidance to define your goals and achieve your next level of success. Go to greenroomcentral.com right now to apply. In case you're curious, this podcast is built on Kajabi. I'm loving how easy it's been to get things set up, but more so, I'm thrilled that my entire business is run within one platform. From my emails, to my pages, to my courses, and now my podcast, it's all under one roof. If you love simplicity and scalability as much as I do, 
then go to greenroomcentral.com to get a free 14-day trial from Kajabi. I appreciate your commitment to leveling up and learning the mindset and strategy of live events. Keep going. Keep learning. If you want more, head over to greenroomcentral.com for show notes and all the links from today's episode.